Okay, so hi, my name is Gideon. Uh, I will present work I've been doing here uh, as part of my uh, graduate studies uh, under the supervision of... Okay, so I present work I've been doing uh, in Adi uh, Mizrahi's lab uh, with my supervisor together with uh, Israel Nelkin. Uh, so Tali talked yesterday about the importance of the dialogue between theoreticians and experimentalists. So I guess that's why I'm here. So hi everybody. Um, I'll present, uh, most of what I will show you has recently been published. And I will also show you some uh, new, uh, new work with uh, the preliminary results. Okay. So uh, basically I'm interested in how neural networks code sensory information, uh, specifically in the auditory cortex. And there are many models about how such networks can code uh, sensory information. Uh, but if, as far as I know, very few, if at all, if any, actually rely on uh, multi- uh, on uh, recordings from such uh, large populations. Um, so, as an experimentalist who doesn't know what the hell he's doing, I will I try to stay as close as possible to what uh, the real brain is doing and actually record from such networks. So, uh, we can start off with a single neuron and we record from it. Uh, this can give us important information regarding the firing statistics of the neuron, its response properties, etc. For example, in the auditory cortex, uh, we have this representation for a tonal re receptive field of a neuron, and let me describe it because I will use it throughout the talk. So uh, this is for one neuron, you have the frequency, we're, we're presenting pure tones, this is a frequency from low to high frequency, and this is the intensity of the tone from low to high intensity, and, typic and the color of each pixel codes the mean response of this neuron to the combination of frequency and intensity. So typically, like in this neuron, you have like a typical frequency which the neuron responds best to, and the higher the intensity of the stimulus, the less selective the neuron is. So um, this is nice, but of course, most mammals have more than just one neuron, uh, which raises the question if you can really understand what is going on by just studying one neuron at a time. <coughs> so on the other extreme, you can look at the whole brain, or large parts of the brain and look at activity patterns using either large-scale electrophysiological techniques or large-scale imaging techniques. And using these kinds of studies, for example, in the auditory cortex, uh, we know there is a tonotopic organization. So let me tell you what that is. Ro in the rostral part of the primary auditory cortex, high frequencies of the stimuli are represented. And in the caudal part, low frequencies are represented. And at least in the classical view, with a very smooth gradient between these two extremes. Sorry, between these two ext extremes. But as I said, we are interested in the intermediate level of local neural populations. So this scale of about 0 to 200 microns and tens to a few hundreds of neurons is relevant for sensory coding because although we don't know the exact connectivities between these specific neurons, they have a high probability of, being, of receiving common input and of being synaptically connected. As you can see from this study, the probability of connection between two, two pyramidal neurons drops quite quickly with a distance going from 0 to 140 microns in this case. <coughs> so we look at these uh, local network uh, networks and we ask questions like how homogeneous or how heterogeneous are the response properties, how different would be uh, this neuron from this in its, in its response properties, and also dynamical questions uh, like how, how, the, uh, how uh, their tendencies to work together, specifically noise correlations. So uh, when I start, start describing our work regarding the microarchitecture and dynamics of these kinds of networks, which we're uh, recording from uh, the live animal. So we do this using a uh, relatively modern technique known as uh, in vivo two-photon calcium imaging. I will quickly say how, how the experimental design, we inject a cal calcium indicator called Fluo4AM into the primary auditory cortex of anesthetized mice. The dye gets taken up by the cells, and then we monitor the relative change in fluorescence of the neurons uh, over time uh, while uh, presenting auditory stimuli. 
Now, during a spike, the intracellular calcium concentration increases, and because uh, this calcium binds to the dye which we have injected, this results in an increase in fluorescence of the neurons, which we monitor using the two-photon microscope. We present in this part of the talk, uh, in this part of the research, uh, tone stimuli range on 19 frequencies ranging from 2 to 45 kilohertz, five attenuation levels, and eight repeats of each such combination. In the second part, uh, we will present more, more repeats, and I will talk about that later. In each animal, we record, Im we, record uh, we image neurons from about half a millimeter deep into the, into the cortex to about 250 microns, and this corresponds to layers 2, 3 in the mouse cortex. The, da the data I will show you in this part is gathered from 11 mice, about 1,600 putative neurons, up to 30 simultaneously, and up to about 200 from each animal. So what I will now show you is a, a Z-Stack. It's a movie going from about half a millimeter uh, deep uh, in the brain to going upwards. What you will see at all... Maybe, can we turn off these lights? So, this one. Okay. okay. Okay, so I hope you could see the uh, green uh, uh, neurons which uh, were loaded with the, with the fluorophore, the calcium indicator. What you're seeing now are astrocytes uh, in red. They, uh, they're stained with a, different, uh, with a different dye, which is not very important for our context now. Now we're moving uh, towards the top, towards the dura matter. We start to see blood vessels. But you could see, I, I hope you could see the, the blob of neurons, which is about a few dozens or hundreds of neurons per injection site from each animal. So typically, about uh, 30 or 40 minutes following the injection, we pick one such optical plane, such as the one you see here. We guide the laser beam to go through a line which crosses our neurons of interest, and then this line is continuously, repeatedly acquired, uh, and the, the fluorescence that these neurons uh, produce uh, is, is gathered while, uh, while we play auditory stimuli. So just a word about how the data looks like. Um, so this is the raw data. So this line is, as I said, is continuously acquired. So each line here corresponds to one crossing of the line through these uh, neurons. So these uh, bright columns that you see here are crossings of uh, cell somas. And I think you can see, even though it's quite small and with the bare eye, these uh, transients, which, uh, so this is the time, scale, the time axis now, which uh, rise pretty abruptly and uh, decay quite slowly, and these uh, presumably, as, as I will show, uh, correspond to spiking activity of the neurons. So, and what are the other bright yeah. So, other bright stripes which don't show these transients can be either astrocytes or non active neurons. I will talk about that. So, so this is the time axis. Is oh, so I, here I think I'm showing about 1,000 runs or something. So, we acquire each line, uh, the rate is about 200 to 300 hertz. So each line is uh, yeah, take about two to three milliseconds. Yeah. Okay. So uh, just quickly, if we plot a cross correlation uh, matrix of these of these pixels over here, what you see is, and this is important. Uh, I won't go into too much too much detail, but you can see that overall there's very little correlation between uh, two uh, two pixels in this picture. And if at all, you do get. Uh, I hope I don't know if you see it very well here, but you do get correlation within two pixels which are belong to the same cell body. And also sometimes between pixels, I don't think you see it very well here, but between pixels that belong to different cell bodies. Importantly, uh, this actually tells you that the signal coming from, a diff uh, from each cell is, n is, is coming from the cell and is not contaminated by a very strong neuropile signal, which, which can occur if you do this experiment uh, in the wrong way. And I won't, I won't talk about this too much, maybe in the end, but... Uh, this is the kind of, uh, of, of data, or ac actually the other kind of data that made us uh, take the analysis uh, quite seriously. Question? Yeah. So why do you get perfect? You do. It's, uh, yeah, you just don't see it. It's a, it's a brown. You mean why the diagonal is not perfect? It is. Okay. Yeah, it's, yeah, you can see it here. Okay. So let me show you an example of uh, uh, just a part of a recording which uh, we did. So now I'm giving you uh, uh, the, the recording from this neuron over here while playing auditory stimuli. And what you see is the relative change in fluorescence. OK, 
Okay, and you see these typical increases, uh, these transients, which occur both, both spontaneously and in response to some of the stimuli. But of course, we wouldn't be using this method to record one urine at a time. We, can't, we have electrophysiology for that. We, what you see now is the recording from 10, 28 neurons simultaneously, uh, such as the ones you saw previously. They are very close to each other, about within 150 to 200 microns. And for most of them, you can see these typical transients again which and you, even by eye, I think you can see that sometimes they do occur in multiple units simultaneously, but overall the activity is pretty individual. So th this is nice, I think, but uh, this raises the question of if these calcium transients actually report spiking activity. And let me tell you the end. The, the, uh, the answer is that if you just take these, trans these traces as they are and treat them as integ integrals over some spiking activity, the answer to this is no. Okay, this can introduce real bias into your data, and I will, I will now describe what we did to actually identify when we can uh, rely on, on these transients and when not. So to do this, we performed a set of combined experiments. So now we're both imaging these neurons. So this is a flu 4 AM loaded neuron, and simultaneously we're recording the spikes coming from it. And we wanted to, co to see if, if indeed there is a correlation between these calcium transients and the spikes that uh, uh, this uh, neuron is undergoing. So let me just show you an example run from this experiment. So I think you get the idea. There's a very nice correlation uh, between these transients and the spiking activity. So there is a stimulus here? No, nope. this is spontaneous. Just spontaneous. Yeah. Um, and, uh, okay, and we developed a very simple algorithm to uh, do two things. First, assess the quality of a given trace, a given calcium trace. Actually, what we do... No, okay. the volume of the... Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so... The algorithm does two things. It assesses the quality of the calcium signal. Actually, it assesses the signal-to-noise ratio of these, tra of these transients compared to the uh, noisy fluctuations. And for traces which, uh, we, which the algorithm determines do report spike uh, reliably, we identify these, these events. So I will tell you uh, shortly how this algorithm works, but I will just point out we have, the algorithm has a 4% false positives rate. So you see here the algorithm determined there was a spike here and there wasn't, and about 9% of all spikes are missed. So the algorithm works as, as follows. Given a calcium trace, uh, okay, so th this is just a part of it, but a calcium trace from a single neuron, for each local maxima in the trace, two, two values are uh, assigned. The first is the amplitude of the local maxima, and the second is the integral from just before the local maxima to about 250 milliseconds afterwards. So you can imagine that uh, given traces, as you saw before, with these noise, low noise fluctuations and these high transients, you would get... A if you, if you, as, as we, you will see, if you, dis, if you plot the distribution of these uh, two points in, in a 2D dimension, you will get a, a cloud for the noisy, uh, small local maximas and some tail, uh, or hopefully separated, but not always, uh, of these uh, transients. So we do that. So let me uh, explain what you see here. So this is, for example, from an astrocyte, which does not fire these spikes or does not show these events. So this is a part of its trace. If you plot the distribution of these two values for all its local maxima, this is what you get. Same for a neuropilot or a non-active neuron, you get just a, like a 2D Gaussian blob, more or less, with all these noisy uh, local maxima. However, for an active neuron, which does exhibit these transients, you get, in addition to the noise uh, cloud, an additional tail, okay, of high values for amplitude and for transients, and uh, these correspond pretty well to these transients. So you see these transients marked with the uh, black dots appear here. So what the algorithm does, first, it, uh, it, uh, according to the, uh, to the shape and density of this cloud, it determines where the border goes between the cloud and the, the tail. Of course, we would be very happy if the tail was totally separated from the cloud, but that's uh, not how it looks. Uh, then it uh, computes a separation score. 
So this, this I, I can tell you, I can go into more detail, but generally this would get a high separation score and these would get a low separation score. Neurons which do not pass this threshold, so we, we, set, we set the threshold based on the simultaneous recordings. Neurons which do not pass this threshold, su such as these three, would be just thrown away. And these kinds of neurons which would pass uh, would be included in the data and these transient identified. So actually... So the thresholds are determined by different neurons, by a small subset of neurons. Yeah, we ran simultaneous recordings and we found that the higher the separation score, the better the algorithm identifies these spikes. And we found such a threshold with... Uh, if you if you pass if, you, if the separation score is higher than this threshold, you really would do well on identifying these spikes. So actually, we find that at this stage we throw away four to five percent of our data, and this goes back to what I said before. You have to really, uh, if you if you if you want to do it seriously, you have to really. Uh, not all traces are equally reliable, and you have to really identify uh, what you take and what you don't. So uh, this data is then converted to these events. So you can see here example from traces with no red lines. So these were just discarded by the algorithm. Indeed, you can see that they do not show these typical calcium transients. And those who do are converted into uh, these discrete events. And all analysis are performed on these traces from now on. Okay. So do you think the false negatives are uncorrelated in neurons? So the assessing correlations are very critical. The false negatives you get, what do you get? Yeah. Actually, what motivated us most for doing this analysis is cases like this. I don't know if you can see here. So this neuron really uh, had a, a, a nice event, or this, and this neuron had a nice event here. And this, which is uh, junk, al also showed a, a small increase. So th this is the most dangerous kind of bias you can get because it's consistent, and I think it comes from optical uh, contamination. And then you would get like two neurons that have a very high correlation when actually you don't, okay? So actually, th these are the, exactly the cases we wanted to rule out, where you get small increases, but they do, do not have the specific shape of uh, spike evoked transients. Okay, so let me show you some, uh, some responses. This is an FRA, as I described before, for a single neuron, uh, frequency going from 2 to 45 kilohertz, and the intensity rising on this axis. So if you look at this big orange pixel over here, you see this is a uh, stimulus that the, the neuron responded strongly to. It's, you see the single trials over here. This is a stimulus. And it was, as you can see, it was very consistent in responses to this kind of stimulus. If you take a different uh, frequency, 45 kilohertz over here, at the same intensity level, con it consistently did not respond to it, etc. However, this neuron, of course, was imaged together with many other neurons. I'll show four of them here. And what you can see is that some, some responses are very consistent, but usually uh, uh, there's no 100% uh, uh, success rate. Uh, neurons can be very similar in their uh, responses to a given stimulus or very different, okay? This stimulus, uh, this neuron was very unresponsive to this stimulus, while this neuron was responsive, etc. So I think you get a first taste of the heterogeneity in these local networks, even though these neurons are very close to one another. So the first thing that popped out, so uh, again, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm telling you about results we, we, we're, we got from these local ne neural networks, which are very close to one another. And the first thing that popped out was the large uh, proportion of non-responsive or, or non-selective neurons. So this is an example of a selective neuron, responsive and selective neuron. This is its FRA, a part of its trace. And this is a post-stimulus time histogram. Okay, so in this uh, shaded area, the stimulus was given, and you see a very sharp and uh, clear increase in event rate, in firing rate following the stimulus. Uh, a different neuron, which was recorded simultaneously, has a very flat uh, post-stimulus time histogram, and importantly, this did not result bec because it was not spiking. As you can see here, it also has these typical events. It, the, the, the spiking was simply not locked to the stimuli. So I'll show, this is the one optical plane, for example. So each FRA here is positioned uh, in the relative location of the neuron from which it was recorded. And what you can see is that actually, we, not only did we find that about half were unresponsive or unselective, but that these neurons were intermingled within the local population. Okay, it's not like you have an unresponsive area separated from the responsive area, but they, they actually form uh, one local network. And it is fair to assume, okay, as one, one of the reviewers did, that uh, such uh, blank FRAs might be responsive to more complex stimuli than what we play, and I will talk about more, uh, about, uh, more about that in the end. So let's look a bit more on these uh, FRA maps. 
just a few examples to get the flavor. So uh, again, these two neurons were recorded uh, simultaneously in the same plane, and you can see they have quite similar response properties, okay, around the same frequencies and the same uh, width. Okay, this is a different representation of the two. But I think already you can see that th this neuron has very different response properties. It res responds to much lower frequencies. And you can see that here as well. Two neurons that are practically touching each other, uh, having very different uh, response areas. So neuron number four responds to, to lower, it's like uh, at least one octave lower frequencies than uh, neuron number three. So, uh, one important aspect which was very uh, we studied a lot about uh, auditory cortex organization is its tonotopicity, as I described in the beginning. So each such FRA, not each of them, but some of them have this characteristic frequency. So this is the, the frequency they respond to the most. And uh, in this study, for example, but many other studies as well, showed that the character characteristic frequency is uh, represented gra with a gradient. So this is the primary auditory cortex. In this study, they did the multi-unit activity recordings. Every dot here is one penetration, and the number next to the dot is the characteristic frequency recorded in that site. So you see that in the caudal end, low frequencies are represented, and in the rostral end, high frequencies are represented, and I think you can see that it's a, it's a very smooth gradient in the large scale. Okay? But this is, the, this is the, the scale. So this is 250 microns. This is more or less the distance between two adjacent recording sites. And we're interested in what goes on just in this, in this kind of, uh, of scale. Okay, what, what, what goes on here between these two? Uh, and our assumption was that since this is, uh, looks so smooth, then so would uh, the local uh, networks look like. And this was wrong. So what we found is actually that tonotopic or organization breaks locally. So here you see a bunch of neurons which were recorded from a single animal. This is in 3D and this is from a top view. They are color coded according to their best frequency. And I think uh, you would agree that you don't see any uh, obvious trend or gradient here. Uh, if you plot the best frequency as a function of the catharostral distance, you don't see any correlation here. Neither in this experiment, which has more neurons. <coughs> okay, many neurons, they're intermingled. You have neurons responding to very low frequencies next to ones responding to very high frequencies. And you don't see any obvious gradient. So Just let me... Did Sorry? You, did you uh, get the global structure? Uh, yeah, so that's this. So in one experiment, one out of 11, we were able to, uh, to stain two, uh, er two areas, two separate areas in the same animal, which allowed us to record from uh, a larger area, as you can see here. And in this, only in this uh, case did we see uh, like a tonotopic, significant tonotopic trend. Yeah. Is it consistent with the Yeah, so we tested this. If you take a slice of two, if you take like the, only these neurons over here, you would, you would not get a, a significant tonotopic trend. But it, means, it must mean that any local region is dominated by some frequency, right? Yeah, so, wh yeah, so wh what, what we think is going on is that in the large scale you do have something ordered, but locally it's, it's very mixed. I guess that depends on how, you, how much you zoom in. I mean, this tells you that if you zoom out enough, like around 300 micro, 350, you start seeing it, and below that, you don't. Uh, so the characteristic frequency is important, but it does not convey all the information a, a, a receptive field uh, shows you. So these are two FRAs. What we now calculate is signal correlations between pa pairs of neurons. So th this is simply the correlation between these two matrices for two different neurons. So in this case, the signal correlation is high. You can see the active area is, more, is very similar. Uh, and for these two neurons, which were also recorded simultaneously, the signal correlation is low. This actually is a pretty interesting group of neurons, which we're still thinking about. It seems to respond to a specific intensity level rather than a specific re frequency. Um, yeah, and we're, we're still thinking about that. So we can calculate the signal correlation between all pairs uh, in, a, in a single animal, uh, as you see here. And because we know the exact location at the level of almost uh, a micrometer, uh, we can also correlate that with the distance between the neurons. So overall, uh, from uh, all pairs which were uh, recorded in the same animals, you, we get a surprisingly low signal correlation values. Okay? Uh, so this is in, uh, you see the distribution here in yellow compared to shuffle data in red. And you see that although uh, the, the yellow uh, distribution is uh, significantly higher than the red one, 
it's, it's low, okay? Over the entire population, it averages about 0 0.07 or 0 0.08. And I think for uh, primary sensor area and neurons that are so uh, close together and belong to the same population, uh, this is surprisingly low. But this is consistent with the long distance, or this is... Uh, this so, now, now I'll show you uh, with regard to the distance. Is it, this is what you're asking? Okay, so this is a signal correlation as a function of the distance. And what we see here is that although signal, the mean signal correlation is very low, there is still a significant decrease with distance from 0 to 200 microns. Okay, so this uh, in yellow is uh, data from one experiment, but in red is the line the, describing the, uh, the whole data. So it's cut here, but uh, so you see there, there is a significant, small but significant decrease of signal correlation uh, with distance, which uh, becomes more or less zero at, at around 200 microns. But but it, So you're, so you're asking if the, the, the slope is the same as the, so uh, it, it depends which, which, uh, which study you're comparing to. Okay, so uh, studies which did, for example, multi-unit multi recordings, they, found, they find smoother gradients. Uh, uh, but I, I think, and we can talk about them more, but uh, I think uh, then you are biased towards uh, neurons with some response properties and you average uh, the, the responses over a few neurons, etc., and then you would obviously get a smoother, a smoother gradient uh, than what we did. tells you exactly that it's good to measure signal correlations because there is more to an FRA than just the characteristic frequency. Okay, and I think that's exactly what we catch here that we didn't in the previous one. Uh, but I think also what you see here is that the variance also decreases, and I, I, I don't show it here, but it's, it's uh, significant. Okay, at close distances, the variance is large. You get pairs which are both high, highly similar, high signal correlation and low signal correlation, and at larger distances, all pairs will mostly be uh, very dissimilar. Uh, to one another. Of course, none of this appears in the, in the random data. And, and this observation that neurons that are very similar have to be close together, but uh, they can also be different, but neurons that are far apart will be different, prompted us to send this uh, picture as, uh, as our suggestion for the cover. So you do get a global gradient overall uh, in, the, in the population, and two neurons which are very far apart will be, have a, will be very different uh, will, uh, will be very different with a high probability. But if you look locally, they can be either similar or very different. So next, we analyze noise correlations of pairs of neurons within the population. So as you know, pairs of neuron uh, noise correlation measures the tendency of two neurons to fluctuate together uh, or not uh, above and below their mean uh, uh, the mean response. So this is eight trials of two. Uh, this is real data from eight trials. You see that the green and the, and the white neuron do not tend to respond in the same trials, and uh, indeed the no noise correlation is low, and here it, the contrary occurs. So what we found is that uh, overall pairs we measured uh, simultaneously is that actually we find a quite a high noise correlation value. Okay, so it averages about 0 0.18. I, I guess uh, we can argue if, if that's a low or high number. I will talk a little more, a bit more that, about that in the end. Uh, but again, uh, we see that with the distance, uh, the signal correlation decreases. Uh, noise the noise correlation decreases, thank you. But again, I think the most uh, obvious thing here is not the mean, it's the variance. Okay, the variance is huge, and at any given distance between two neurons, you can have very high or very low uh, noise correlation values. The, so you're asking about the error bars here. At any at any given distance, yeah. So we did. You mean to bin into some? Uh, the the error bar in the individual noise correlation is big, right? That would depend on the scatter. Yeah, yeah. I'm saying if we if we look at this, it's it. No, 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 no. no. Just a given pair. When you say the correlation of a given pair is point one, so it's point one plus minus one. Because of this, uh, because no, of the it's finite number of repetitions and so on. So you can. No, we calculate this, the noise correlation over. Similar in all repetitions in this case. Yeah, but it's the there is no standard deviation. Sort of 
Sorry? Yeah. It's like when you say the mean is so. 5, for example, it's 5 plus minus 1 because it's the final example. What is that? Yeah. For the noise corrections, yeah, I do. I think I do. No, I don't have it here. Uh, but we did calculate it. So, okay, I, I understand the, the motivation, but in this case, in contrast to what we, uh, we did later, we calculate noise correlation over all trials from all uh, stimuli together, so we don't have these error bars. So, ma yeah, maybe we can compare it to the to the random shuffle data and see see the variance, compare the variance. I think, as, as far as I remember, the variance is much lower if you if you plot it this way, but I don't have it here. The signal correlation. Okay. Yeah, but it's it's. Uh, I think I think it's less. But yeah, it's a it's a it's a good point. We have to we have to look at that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we should look at that. Yeah. Pre okay. Okay. Uh, well, we should look at that uh, and calculate. I, I calculate the the error bars. So, but yeah, one more point here is that uh, because we have so many pairs of neurons using this method, around 4,000 pairs, we, 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 I, th I think we, we, we are on to, to some things that have a low probability, like this small tail here, which we're still thinking about, uh, which are neurons with exceptionally high noise correlation values. So lastly, in this part, I want, to, uh, I want to present this slide, which is that actually signal correlation and noise correlation are correlated. <laughs> So uh, what you see here is the noise correlation is a function of signal correlation. Each dot here is a pair, okay? And what, we, and th this, correla what this correlation actually means is that two neurons that have similar mean response properties also tend to fire in the same trials and vice versa. But this is beyond, both of them are correlated with distance. Yeah. Both so, of them. so is it beyond that? If you look at the given, the given distance, and you look at the yeah, I understand that. around this mean, and you ask whether neurons which happen to be more, more highly signal, signal correlated are also noise correlated. Yeah, if this exceeds the, the effect of the distance. Yeah, we, have, we haven't looked at that. Okay, so I want to summarize this first and longer part. So uh, we have a set of ex experimental system to do with optophysiological recordings from a primary auditory, cort auditory cortex in mice in vivo. We found basically that local heterogeneity is embedded within large-scale order, and that noise correlations are overall high, variable, and decrease with distance, and also that there is a uh, correlation between signal and noise correlation. So I will uh, now like to talk about the uh, work that I'm in progress that uh, is actually happening these days. So this is a schematic of the auditory system, uh, the ear, and, and going upwards. And the, the area which we have uh, been uh, discussing is the, the primary auditory cortex, which is located here. So uh, the, the stimuli that we've been uh, presenting to the mice are very simplified uh, synthetic stimuli that they would never encounter in, in real life in nature. And uh, I think it is fair to assume that the primary auditory cortex is supposed to do something more than simple pure tone coding, which already occurs at, at much lower levels. So one hypothesis might be that the primary auditory cortex uh, processes sounds dependent on the context in which they are heard. Okay, so uh, to test this uh, hypothesis, we've, uh, we've been, we're looking at the, this uh, experimental setup, processing of natural sounds in the auditory cortex. This is a mother mouse, and these are her pups, four or five days old. Pup mice uh, communicate with their mother with a number of... Uh, a natural cause. One of them is called USVs, ultrasonic vocalizations, and they occur at about 60 kilohertz, much higher than our hearing range. So when, a, when such a pup is isolated from its nest, it starts emitting these calls, uh, which prompts the mother to go, to go and get him. So uh, just quickly, a pure tone is, of course, a, a perfect sine wave, and the spectrogram is, is very narrow. A USV looks something like this. It can vary a little bit, depending on the age of the animal, etc. But something like this, uh, there is a, a strong band at about 60 kilohertz with a, a little bit of mo modification, and uh, then at about 90 kilohertz. So it's very high frequency calls. And uh, I want to just stress the point that at this stage, we're presenting every stimulus uh, with m many more repeats. So instead of eight in the previous uh, setup, now we're presenting them 40 to 70 times, which allows us to calculate stimulus-specific uh, noise correlations. Okay, which is important because we want to compare the responses to, uh, the pure tone, to every pure tone and to the USBs. If we 
No. No, no. We have uh, usually we play 15 stimuli, which include three to four types of USVs, broadband noise, and then about 10 uh, pure tones from 2 to 62 kilohertz. And the different USVs are the recorded? Yeah, we recorded the, the in our lab, and uh, yeah, you will see a few of these. Uh. So I will show you now a short movie of a behavioral uh, experiment we did in the lab with uh, Hadar Moria. So here in the lower right, you will see the mother in her nest with her pups. On the other side, uh, this is an experimental cage. On the other side will be an isolated pup. In the middle, a shallow uh, water barrier. Show the pup. This is the pup. This is the mother in her nest. This is a USV detector. This is not the original soundtrack, but... The pup will be waiting a certain length of time before it can use it. Yeah, so just one second. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we are, it, it starts emitting these USVs usually after uh, like half a minute or so, it varies a bit. So, uh, to be honest, th this is a very good mother, and not all, well, not all mothers are as good as this one. Um, but still, it is it's pretty well established that mothers do go uh, to fetch their pups when they hear the USVs, and m at much higher rates than uh, the naive mice. And based on, uh, so this is an important point here, that USVs have a different behavioral context in mothers compared with naive mice. So based on that, now we want to compare the responses of naive uh, mice to mother mice, to the pure tones and to the USVs. This is, this is in particular for mother, 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 mother. Uh, No. So we record the, uh, the USVs and we play the same set to all mice. Uh, but uh, they, they respond uh, strongly enough. Uh, and we will specifically look at noise correlation. I will show you the results in a second. But I will just show, the, I want to stress that there are a few comparisons which are interesting here. First, the responses of mothers to tones compared with the responses to USVs. This might tell you something about the importance of context. And also, uh, this comparison over here, the responses of mothers to USVs compared to naive animals. And we'll look specifically, at, uh, mostly at those correlations. So first, just a raster plot to show you uh, how things uh, look like. So here you have 40 trials of each stimulus. So this is one USV, second USV, third USV, broadband noise, and then tones ranging from 2,500 hertz to 62 kilohertz. This is where the stimulus was given. And uh, you see uh, four cells uh, here. Each dot represents one event from a, from a, from a cell. And uh, so in this case, as you can see uh, uh, very quickly, th these are off responses. So sometimes you get on responses, which are triggered by the onset of the stimulus, and sometimes off responses, as in this case. But uh, I think it's interesting to see, even this is quite interesting, because these cells seem to respond almost only to these USVs. Okay, and not to any other uh, tone, maybe something here, but certainly not as strong. And notably not to 62 kilohertz, the pure tone, which is more or less the same frequency as the USB. So, uh, so this is data we're really uh, starting to look into now. And if we look at the per trial uh, responses, so this is uh, 40 trials from 1 to 40, 4 cells, and this is a specific USB. And the color codes the, the relative response of this, uh, of this neuron to the, the specific trial. And uh, there's a, a lot to study here, but I think, first of all, you can see that there is no set pattern of uh, activation which occurs uh, very often. Okay, to every uh, trial, these were, of course, they, they were not given one after the other. They were distributed throughout all other stimuli. And uh, sometimes all of them uh, respond, but other, otherwise, uh, each subset can respond uh, uh, of the neurons, and this is not set. If you look at the noise correlation between these pairs, uh, they can also vary. Interestingly, for this pair, the noise correlation for this first USV was very low, and in response to this second USV, it was, uh, it was uh, much higher. <coughs> so th these are things we're, going, uh, we're starting to look at now. But the last slide I want to show you, and uh, for me the nicest one, is this which summarizes the noise correlation data from mothers and naive USVs and pure tones. So this is the noise correlation. Uh, the data from the first part, where we presented the naive uh, animals with pure tones, averaged noise correlation around here, so 0 0.18. So now, to a naive uh, mouse, 
when we presented them with pure tones, we got a, a pretty similar uh, noise correlation value, so around 0 0.22. Uh, in response to USV, surprisingly, it was a bit lower. This is not significant, however, yet, but uh, interesting. In mothers, in response to pure tones, again, the noise correlation values are uh, in the same ballpark, uh, but then uh, not significantly different from, for example, uh, the responses of naive animals to pure tones. But the nicest thing here is here, in response to USVs, uh, the mothers had a noise correlation value which was significantly higher than the responses to the pure tones, and also even more significantly higher than uh, the responses of naive animals to, uh, to these USVs. Yeah, so, uh, as a I mean, the first thing to say is that uh, increasing the firing rate does not mean, does not imply directly that you will get higher noise correlation levels. If this is the, the source, is something that we're looking at these days, actually. If this might contribute to the increased uh, noise correlation. These are mice that have never been mothers. These are mice that have never been mothers. They're all the same age, 8 to 10 weeks, and they're simply naive. They're Yeah, so th there's another uh, guy in the lab, uh, a postdoc, Leo, uh, which is uh, really looking into uh, if the experience with the pups is something that is sufficient to trigger this, or if you have to be a mother, etc. And this is uh, also a work that is undergoing. Is also, uh, yeah. So I won't say it's anything. It's known that once once they've been mothers, they retain this Yeah, so you, you're not referring to the noise correlation, you're behaviorally. Yeah, behaviorally. Yeah, behaviorally they retain something, but uh, I think uh, for some parameters it does decrease uh, after some time, for others, others no. So let me summarize this with a focus on the noise correlation. So using our experimental system, we have measured noise correlation between thousands of precisely localized uh, neighboring neurons, uh, neuron pairs. So, of course, the existence, origin, and implications of these mean positive noise correlations in the cortex is uh, controversial. Uh, but I think, I think at least under some conditions, high noise correlation implies a trade-off between increased redundancy on the one hand, which means a decreased network capacity, and increased reliability. So the more and more neurons you have that are doing exactly the same thing, whether they are highly correlated, you have something which is more reliable on the one hand, but uh, can code less information. Why is more reliable to have correlated noise? So if you have a stimulus which is, uh, for example, important for the animal, and you want uh, a downstream area to get the information uh, as reliably as possible, you would, you would make the... The signal correlation. No. You, you would want them all to respond in the same trials. We don't know where the noise correlation comes from. It can, come, it can be one with no does make the network do the same thing more or less I mean more uh, it doesn't make it it doesn't make it right okay uh, okay but this raises the hypothesis that perhaps high noise correlation values would exist only uh, were increased were only where uh, you would want reliability is required okay for coding for an important stimuli for example and uh, if this is true, we found that, uh, well, no, first we found that noise correlation are variable and decreased with the distance between the neurons uh, in, in the range we checked. And preliminary results suggest that in the auditory cortex, increased behavioral relevance, so the use fees for the mother uh, are more uh, relevant for the mother, uh, is correlated with uh, increased levels of noise correlation. Uh, so we, we certainly have to still look into the, uh, why that is and our interpretation, but uh, the results show, so, so at least the preliminary results, that there is uh, a correlation with the relevance. And as I said, we will, we will now be looking in more into this uh, origin and of these uh, noise correlations. Thank you. So you're asking
asking if we found neurons that respond only to USVs, in other words. And uh, yeah, I think you saw them just uh, in the raster plot. Right, but uh, in a sense, does that mean, do you think you know how to handle all the, all the holes? The uh, well, the holes there are, are holes for pure tones, so they don't exactly fit in. But uh, the question if you have like grandmother cells which respond only to natural stimuli, it's a good question. Uh, uh, just by, for example, this raster plot, it seems that it might be possible. To be fair, you have to compare the USVs not with a pure tone, but with something that also has uh, uh, something that is modified in the intensity and the frequency, but it's early days. Sure, I understand the question, but say, well, say there's a not a. That's a mostly 20 hertz, and then I have. You said, I could have a 40 hertz uh, cell there as well. Right? That's simplified. You actually get everything. I mean, I think as you saw in the best frequency plot, you get like this. It's not like you have a all blue and then one red inside. It's 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 a chaos, so more or less. So, but do the signal correlation results tell me in which way these these uh, different differently tuned cells are? No, because there are no differently tuned. They're all different. But maybe we'll talk about that. 